Welcome to the first Horsch Live Field Day. My name is Michael Braun and I'll present today's program. Well, we've got a bit of a situation here. You can see our live broadcast here with the work we've done in the field. We've had rain this night and looking at the field this morning made it clear we unfortunately won't be able to drive in. Of course, we prepared for these kinds of situations. We looked at the weather yesterday and recorded everything yesterday afternoon. So, we've got all the contents we wanted to show you. We've prepared it in a way that we're going to show the recorded machine section and then answer your questions from the chat live. I'll be supported by the product manager for that particular product to give you as much information as possible. So, I'd like to wish you an interesting field day with our machines. We'd like to begin with our founder, Michael Horsch. Michael wants to say a few words to introduce the topic of hybrid agriculture. The camera is all yours, Michael. Well, hello everybody. It's a bit unusual having a camera in front of you instead of a few hundred farmers. If it wasn't for Corona, this would be much more interesting. But unfortunately, that's not possible today. Yes, I think Corona taught us a thing or two in the past six to eight months. But that's not changing the fact that agriculture is facing the biggest transformation we've ever seen. Or at least the biggest transformation I've seen over the past 40 years that I've been doing this. It's also getting clearer that topics like hybrid agriculture that we've been focusing on were pretty much right on the money. At least when you're looking at it from a Green Deal point of view. That's the set of policies Europe adopted to direct future climate protection efforts. The Green Deal encompasses a number of categories. One of them is impacting the automotive industry. That's very noticeable right now. Maximum 95 grams per kilometer. That's the maximum average emission allowed for cars sold by a manufacturer. If you exceed that, it's going to be a steep fine. And that's starting to impact our automotive manufacturers' revenues. So, you see, Europe is getting serious. Something similar is going to happen to us in the agricultural sector. I've got a pretty positive attitude towards this, though. If you're looking at the entire concept of farm to fork, we've got very clear guiding principles here. One of them, 50% less plant protection. The question is, based on what? That's being negotiated but the principles have been set. The second, 20% fertilizer. That's rather strict. The third one is going to impact livestock owners. Antibiotics will need to be reduced by 50%. And finally, until 2050, they want to have at least 25% ecological farms. So if you're my age, you might just think, do you know what, that doesn't concern us at all. We've got 30 years until then. Why should I care about this? Let the next generation handle it. No, they've been very clever about this. That's their overall goal. But here's the thing, until 2030, they want to have 50% of the overall goal. So it's getting both a bit more serious as well as more interesting for us. So, as I mentioned before, what we're planning today is basically a presentation of agricultural and technological solutions. It's what we think the future is going to be like. That's not just ecological farming that we're interested in, but also conventional farming, where development is going into a particular direction, towards hybrid farming. We've got another term for hybrid agriculture, which we've used as well. That's regenerative farming. We've reached the point where the term regenerative is a bit overused and quite a few farmers feel offended at the implicit assumption they've done something wrong the past 30 years. 
That's not the case, so we should be a bit more careful with this term. Even if it stands for a range of very interesting processes and concepts for the future. As I mentioned it before, we're just calling it hybrid farming. That's a bit more neutral, a bit clearer. So, let's see what we have in store for you today. Once again, that's both for ecological as well as conventional farming. Now then, camera, lights, action, enjoy! Welcome to the first Horsch Digital Field Day. I bet you're asking yourselves why anybody would set up a field day at the end of October. Well, we thought it's a good way to conclude the season and we decided to have it in a bit of a less hectic time of the year. So you can be here with us to look at our new concepts right in the field. I'm here on the field close to our Schwandorf headquarters. We've prepared everything to demonstrate chopping, harrowing, sowing and removing existing vegetation. And finally, we'll also talk a bit about chemical plant protection. I'm Michael Braun. I'll accompany you through all the presentations and introduce the stations we've got for you today. I'm not going to give a long speech here, just let me say this. Don't hesitate to use the chat to ask us questions about the machines. We're happy to answer all your questions. Let's begin with our transformer. So, let's walk over to Johannes, my colleague, who's already waiting to tell us a bit more about the technical details. Hello, Michael. Hello, Johannes. Johannes, Transformer VF. That's something new from Horsch. What are we talking about here? So here we've got our Transformer 6 VF. 6 stands for 6 meters working width. VF stands for variable frame. Variable frame means that this machine is able to cover row spacings from 25 centimeters up to 80 centimeters. We've hitched the machine to a 150 HP tractor. No front ballast. That's a fairly streamlined combination. Let's start at the rear of the machine. Back here, we've got the sliding frame. That's how it looks like. The machine frame is fully integrated with the machine. Two advantages to that. The weight of the machine is close to the tractor. That means we're not going to need a large tractor and just a small frontal ballast, or none at all. The second advantage, when we're turning or driving on slopes, we've got significantly improved safety. We have a sliding distance of 450 millimeters. Andreas is moving it now. Of course, the sliding frame is designed for the working width. So we've chosen the material thickness for the 6-meter machine in order to fit the 6-meter machine. And we're customizing it for the 12 and 9-meter machines. Below the sliding frame, we've got the disc coulters. We've sized them very large on purpose in order for them to anchor the machine. The class camera system is giving us very precise signals. We need those precise signals in order to be able to properly work, for example, in 25 centimeters of grain without damaging the crop. So our disc coulter acts like an anchor for the machine, so we can transmit these precise movements to the frame. If we look at the concept of the frame, we've designed the frame for the working width. So with a working width of 6 meters, we're going to use a smaller profile. For 9 and 12 meters, we're using a larger profile. That enables us to always strike a perfect balance between stability and working weight of the machine. Here, with a 25 cm row spacing, we've got a working weight of only 1,800 kg. That's pretty impressive, I'd say. We've got our clamping profile at the frame here. That's designed so we have it on the inside here. So the unit is clamped in from the inside. The advantage here is that we get to move everything within the clamping rail, freely move it, that's why we call it variable frame. So we can cover row spacings from 25 centimeters, like here, all the way up to 80 centimeters. Our goal is to be able to cover all sorts of crops with a single machine. Next in our system, we've got our units. We've got very broad mountings for our units, that's on purpose. All right, Michael, you're demonstrating it already. 
We've got these broad mountings to give us good durability as well as high precision. Especially here with 25 cm row spacings and the 18 cm points we've got mounted, we only have a distance of 3 cm to the plants on both sides. So that is going to need good precision so we can avoid destroying the crop row. There are two springs integrated into the unit. The springs are giving us good surface pressure. So that means our points will reliably insert even under dry conditions and with very hard rocky soil. This hydraulic cylinder is supplying our row lift system. Row lift system. That's what we're calling the section control we've got here at this hoe. We can control this manually or have it under automatic control via a GPS signal we're receiving. We're going to look at this in action in a second. So if we take another look at the unit, here we've got the maintenance-free couplings. Those are milled from carbide and originally from our Maestro series. So here we're just taking parts from our company's toolbox. We're taking proven systems and integrating them into our existing models. Over here at the unit, we've got the depth adjuster. Michael, if you'd like to operate this, I'll explain the principle. Right, we've got a depth adjuster with 0.5 cm increments. That's moving our depth guide wheel here at the machine. If we adjust the setting one step up, the height of the depth guide wheel changes by 0.5 cm so we can have a very precise optimal height guidance for the point. Why do we need this kind of precise guidance? The general principle is that we're looking to go as deep as necessary but as shallow as possible, so we can cleanly cut weeds and anything we don't want in our culture without going too deep. So, if we take another look at the unit, we've got different installation spaces here, enabling a number of different row spacings. Later, we're going to take a closer look at that with our Transformer 12. Right, Johannes. I bet our viewers are really looking forward to the demonstration. Let's just have the machine drive for a bit, and then we're going to take a look at the result in the field. Right. All right, Andreas. Let's drive. In order to demonstrate our row lift system, we've gone and built a model headland track. Just look at how gently the units are being withdrawn and inserted again, so we're damaging the crops as little as possible. All right, Johannes, if I want to judge the quality of work of a hoe, what do I need to look at? What are my criteria? In general, we need to look at how shallow or deep we're going to work. What we have here, all these smaller plants, we want to cut them all out and separate them from the soil. So we've achieved that. On the other hand, as you can see, our crops are still standing. If you take a look at the row, you see that all our crops, all plants are still standing. None of them have been buried. Here we could probably even go a bit faster. Well, that takes us nicely to the next question. How much are we going to get under these conditions? Under these conditions, I'd say we make about 5 km per hour here. I think we could probably go faster, as we've not buried anything at all. Under these conditions, I think we should be able to achieve at least 8 km per hour. So, based on the development stage, when would you be able to drive into the crops? The plants shouldn't be any smaller than 7 cm. Otherwise, we're going to bury the crops and damage the crops. Right on cue, crops. Let's take a look at the 12 meter transformer and talk a bit about the options we have when it comes to different row spacings. We've mounted angled points on the left side of this transformer and our standard points on the entire right side. Here we have a 50 cm spacing between the units as well. Same as with the 6 meter machine, you should be able to see driving in the background. We've mounted the blades at 50 cm as well. So we've got a row of crops in the middle and 50 cm spacing. Looking at the points, that's our standard edge-on point. 
Here we've put the bolts in sideways, so the force from the upper spring is properly transferred to the point. And to make sure we've got a good grip on the soil, both on the sides as well as to the rear. We want to achieve a good horizon to work with and make sure we're keeping the proper depth. As I've mentioned at the beginning, as shallow as possible, as deep as necessary. Optionally, this point is available in a carbide version for longer tool life. It's also available in 150 mm width. Right, so walking to the other side of the machine, here's our angled points. We have those angled points for very small crops. You've already talked about this and asked when we're going to drive in there. Let's say we've got maize that's a bit smaller, in 50 or 75 rows. So our crop row would be where I've got my yardstick. All the points are making sure we're not burying the plants. The soil is moved away from the crop row into the middle between the plants. So our crops won't be buried, so we can drive in a bit earlier. Besides the angled blades, do we have any other ways to protect small crops? We can also work with protective screens or plates to protect the crops, so we can drive into the field even earlier, keep the crops clean even earlier and can use a broader toolbox when it comes to the applications. Looking at the 12 VF with 12 meters working width, what's the implications for that for transport? I think our viewers will be quite interested in hearing more about this. Right, that's a very interesting aspect, especially with these working widths. Sophia, please fold the machine right now. We get less than a 4 meter height and less than a 2.95 meter width for transport. That's the benefit of our inner clamping. We're able to fold the outer wings by 180 degrees and have them very snug against the inner wings. That gives us a very narrow transport width of less than 3 meters and a height of less than 4 meters. We'll see that when Sophia has finished folding the machine. Right, working widths. We've got 6 meters and 12 meters here. What else do we have planned? Between the 6 and 12 meter versions, we've also got a 9 meter version. So that closes the gap between those widths. So we've got 6, 9 and 12 meters. All right, dear viewers, now you've got the opportunity to ask Johannes questions about the hoeing technology from Horsch. Okay, Johannes, we did get quite a few questions from the chat regarding our hose. Let me just go ahead with the first question. Question about finger hose. What's our answer to that? In general, we'd be able to mount a finger hoe here. We're currently working on something where we're going to place finger hose behind the unit to work better in a row. Yesterday, we talked a bit about driving speeds. So, the question being, what would be a realistic top speed here? The top speed of the system would certainly be above 15 km per hour. Whether that makes any sense agriculturally is another question. So far, we've done 14 km per hour in maize, that's what we've tested regarding top speed. Well, our next question from the audience happens to be about maize as well. Placing nurse crops during the last hoeing pass. Can we do that? Or how would something like that look like? We're able to mount a distribution tower to the 6 meter, 9 meter or 12 meter machines that we can use to apply a nurse crop precisely onto the crop row or the spacing between rows. So we're able to apply nurse crops or fertilizer. And here's the last question I got. When it comes to pressurizing the hoe elements, what's our options here? We've got a dual spring package for every unit, so we can basically pressurize each unit individually and ensure safe feeding. So that's our questions from the first round. If you've got any questions, now's the time. We're happy to answer your questions. So, let's just go ahead and proceed with part two. 
sewing technology. Next up, how am I going to sew with 25 cm row spacing? To answer that question, I'm going to go to our next station, sewing technology. I've invited my colleague Kai over here so we can talk a bit about the requirements for sewing technology. When I'm looking to mechanically work such a field, be able to hoe it and be able to adjust the row spacings. Hello Kai, let's talk about the Taro now. Let's start with a question. What's the Taro family? Hello Michael. The Taro series features 6 meter wide seed bars that can be coupled to the tractor's three-point hitch. With the Taro series, we were mainly focusing on achieving various row spacings. We're doing that using different packer versions depending on the sewing coulters. We've got different packer rollers with different line spacings in front, so every grain will get identical conditions at the back of each sewing coulter. Different packer versions. So what's the difference between those machines? We're standing in front of a Taro 6SL with a Rollflex packer that's enabling us to achieve different time spacings, 12.5 and 15 centimeters, for instance. Thus, we've also got different numbers of sewing coulters in the rear as well. With our Taro 6HD, the heavy-duty version, we have a tire packer with 15 and 16.7 cm line spacing. And in the rear, our power disc sewing coulter will apply the respective row spacing. To switch between two row spacings, what do I need besides the coulter arrangement? We've set up two distribution towers for the Taro 6SL. So far, two distribution towers were just used to switch off a half side, in this case, two times three meters. Now here we've got optional selective tubing, so when we switch off a sewing head, we're also switching off every second sewing coulter, giving us twice the row spacing. So now we have 25 centimeters instead of 12.5 centimeters on the time spacing. That's pretty interesting. I think we should just look at the result in the field and just drive the machine for a bit. Working speed, that's going to be another interesting question. How fast can you go with this machine? The Taro 6SL is driven with a working speed of 10 to 15 kilometers per hour, as you can see here. So we get a very high impact force and are very agile, as we've got the machine at the three point of the tractor. That's especially useful on smaller fields with plenty of curves, corners, edges and points. What's the power requirements? I've seen it's a fairly compact tractor we're using for a 6 meter sewing machine. This 6 meter sewing machine has a weight of about 2.8 tons. So it's easy to drive with a four cylinder tractor like the one we've hitched up here. Let's take a look at the field again. So what are the requirements that have to be met in order to drill properly? We're using the Taro 6SL in a multi-step procedure. So we're having separate tillage and sewing procedures. That means we need an optimally prepared level field. So the packer roller is just producing some fine soil where we can easily deposit the seed. So we can choose between 12.5 or 25. That's what our machine is designed for. Another question on weight distribution. We're driving with a frontal tank. Could we take a closer look at this? Right, we've got a partner 2000 FT hitch to the Taro. We've got our dual tank with a volume of 2200 liters. It's got a weight of about one ton empty with additional ballast or a bit more with this tire packer. So we can serve various combinations at the rear while maintaining a good weight in front. And the tire packer is reducing the weight on the front axle so we can minimize soil compaction. Dual tank, so we've got two seeds. What other options do we have? We can use two seeds, different seeds. We can fill a tank with fertilizer or microgranular compounds to utilize the machine as much as possible and get a number of options when it comes to filling it. Now the machine rests on the tire packer. 
Can you tell us a bit more about this one? With our partner 2000 FT, we've got a tire packer that's giving us a steering control of 200 degrees. So when I'm driving into the headlands or drilling in the headlands, I've got a bit of a turn, a bit of feel that's not straight. So then it's steering as well, not pushing any earth and following the tractor steering. So there's another thing that might be interesting. Can I have other combinations? We've seen Partner and Taro so far. What else do we have in our portfolio? Our Partner series features its own computer. So we can mount a Hosh Maestro at the back, an Express 4KR, our Taro or a range of other tillage equipment. We can mount a distribution tower to deeply deposit fertilizer or mount deflector plates in front of the packer rollers to sow catch crops in a single step. Kai, thank you very much for the first impressions. And of course, feel free everybody, if there are any questions we've not answered here, just put them in the chat. We're happy to go into the detail. So, we're back with our second live Q&A session. Kai, we've got a few questions regarding the Taro as well. First question, how fast will I be able to switch between the two row widths? If I've got selective tubing with 12.5 and 25 cm row spacing, like with this machine with dual tower and selective tubing, all I need to do is press a button. I can just use the half side switch off for the front tank to select between the two row spacings. When I've got mechanical half-width switch off, I need to dismount and toggle the flap in front. Second question is about the partner we've got in front of the tractor. Do we have a front tank in a single tank version as well, and what's the capacity? We've got the partner 1600 FT with a 1600 litre capacity in a single tank version. Another question regarding the tank. So, we have somebody asking, who's already got a tank from a different manufacturer, can we combine that with our Taro? That's possible, but we've got to look at the pneumatics, the electronics of this tank. We'll have to examine this on a case-by-case -case basis and customize this for the tractor and the rear implement. One last question on the Taro. Is the Taro able to achieve the same culter pressure as the Pronto? We're not quite getting that. For the Taro, we've decided to choose an optimal combination of weight and working width that gives us less dead weight. That, in turn, limits the maximum coulter pressure we can achieve a bit. That's not a problem at all, however, as we can do a good preparation, drill under good conditions, and thus don't need as much coulter pressure as with a Pronto. Thank you, Kai. And again, if you have any questions, ask your questions if you'd like to know more about what we've been telling you. Now we're coming to part three, tillage. Again, we're going to play the recordings from our rehearsal. Now I'd like to proceed with the next topic. That's a well-prepared field. So before sowing, we want to do some good preparation. So let's go visit Roman in our tillage section. We're going to introduce two machines today. I'd like to start with a bit more shallow tillage. Hello, Roman. Hello, Michael. Roman, you've brought the finer to the field. Could you give us a short overview over the finer? Of course, I'd like to start with the finer's history. We've presented the finer last year at the Agritechnica 2019. Farming is clearly moving towards non-chemical plant protection. So that means we'll have to work year-round and need to have tillage equipment on hand to remove weeds and perform full-length cutting year-round. We had very clear requirements here. A machine without a packer. We need a machine with a heavy harrow, ideally with hydraulically adjustable aggressivity. I can show it again here. Here's the hydraulic cylinders enabling us to comb out organic material and bring it to drying. We've got a four bar construction with this machine with a time spacing of 15 centimeters. Today for the field day, we mounted our 20 centimeter wing points here. 20 centimeter wing points, which provide the whole surface cut at a line spacing of 15 centimeters. But we also have the possibility, especially for seedbed preparation or for springtime, to screw on the five centimeter wide points. 
zum Aufschrauben. In itself, it's a compact machine, without a packer with a heavy harrow. I think now that we're here in the field, we would like to take a look at the machine. Absolutely. Let's give it a try and we'll see the result. Indeed. Roman, the working speed is an exciting topic. What can we expect from the finer? Working speeds depend on the tractor performance. I think the faster the machine, the better the harrow works, which is also very important. There has to be some movement inside the machine. The working speed is 5 km per hour. We can already see here the result of one pass of shallow tillage. There is quite a bit of green material on the surface. What exactly are you examining when you evaluate this? When I evaluate this, I always check whether the tillage is done on the whole surface. Here, the whole surface refers to very light soil. But everything is cut off and above all, the tillage is completely done. All right, if I now have a look at the plant material here, the roots are partially clean of soil. I think this is also a very good effect for drying. Yes, that's right. That's one benefit of our heavy harrow, to aggressively bring this material to the surface. How many passes do you normally need to get everything clean? What's your experience with this? Actually, this depends on the weather. So we must also be prepared to make our tillage even more dependent on the weather in the future. With a single pass, if it remains warm and dry afterwards, we will have an adequate success with weed control. However, I always recommend as many passes as required until the weed is dead. For this, you usually need two or three passes. Of course, we've heard through the grapevine that the concept of the finer is still being developed further. Would you like to give us some more information on that? What you heard is right, Michael. We'll be offering the finer in two versions. One is the version we can see here, with a heavy harrow. We'll also include a variant with a packer. When a packer variant is added to the machine, the machine must become even more compact. For example, we will move the wheel arrangement to the front and to the rear in order to be able to remove the rear wheels and attach the packer here. The whole purpose of this is to have a machine as compact as possible, so that we can also drive larger working widths with the three-point linkage. Working widths. We'll start the series production with six and seven meters. What can you tell me about the angle of the point? Certainly, this must have a great influence on the cutting result. That's right. We've also looked into this. And I've come to the conclusion that if the point or tine is slightly turned forward, it tends to cut better over a larger area. This means that we will continue the concept and adjust the point to a suitable angle so that we can work over the whole surface. The next year with a finer series and of course with new tools will definitely be exciting. Exactly. There's a lot to come. The coming years will be exciting. I've noticed that you brought a second tool for flat cutting in addition to the finer. What exactly did you bring? I would like to ask you to come with me. Here you can see our Turano in combination with the Cultro, our knife roller. This means Cultro mounted in the front, so the whole thing in one combination, exactly as a rig and 3 meter working width. I would like to say a few words about the Cultro. Our Cultro is part of the knife roller segment. The term knife roller is quite complex. It's important to have a good crushing and shredding performance. Thanks to the closed rotor, we are building the most massive knife roller on the market. Knives are in contact with the rotor. We have a 300 mm roller diameter, which allows us to achieve high rotational speeds. In order to crush and shred as much as possible, our Cultro is arranged for an X-shaped cut. That means the first roller works towards this direction. The second roller back here works towards that direction to achieve the highest possible shredding effect. The 3 meter version can be equipped with front ballast, so we can put additional pressure on it. 
Depending on whether the tractor allows for it, pressure can be applied additionally via the hydraulic system. The knife roller is able to withstand this. However, even more interesting is our new terracut points on our Terrano that I brought with me. Our terracut points with 40 cm coulter width at 30 cm line spacing ensure safe cutting under tough conditions. When it comes to clover grass breakage, when it comes to stubble breaking, which should be carried out at a working depth of 5 to 6 cm. Why have we used the Torano? To have a safe tine coulter guide with an appropriate undergrip. You can see it here, I have mounted it here too, our version with the wide coulter wings. Here I would like to show you the differences. On one hand, we've got differences in penetration. You can see it here, we have about 3 to 4 centimeters. And here with the angle of attack, if I look at it in comparison to our terracut point, we have 1 to 2 centimeters penetration depth. We found out that this is enough in the Torano to thoroughly penetrate the soil, especially regarding the angle of attack to cut the whole surface. I would suggest to have a look at this device in the catch crop as well. Roman, before we start, I'd like to ask you one more question. When I take a close look, I can see two different points. What's the reason for that? Points. That is a very good question. Here we have installed our mulch mix point system with HM Plus and our coiled guide plate. And on the other side, our LD point, our LD, which stands for low disturbance, i.e. for even less tillage. With these points, we want to cut, not mix. But we want to show you that our terracut point can be combined with the HM Plus point, but also with a normal standard point from Hosch. Well, I am really excited about it now. Let the machine drive. Indeed. You said earlier regarding the knife roller that speed plays quite an important role here. What can we expect now in terms of speed? At least 12 km per hour, otherwise it makes little sense to me to work with a knife roller. Movement is important here. Similar to a forage harvester, the higher the speed, the better the quality of the cut. Maybe the question is a bit cheeky, but is such a working speed still possible for the tine tool in the rear? I'll be honest, in combination with our terracut point, absolutely. Because the tillage is very shallow here. That means we need less traction. So we can drive at least 12 km per hour. So let's take a look at the ground. What can we see here? When I look at the residues here, I think this is the result of our cultro. And when I dig a little bit here, you can see that the material is cut all over, 100%. In other words, the goal here is to cut off, break capillaries, let it dry? Exactly. Let it dry out and destroy the catch crop, so that we can sow in the following working step. So, now we have another look inside the machine. Here it drove slower. You can also see it quite clearly. The slower you drive, the more difficult it is for the knife roller. On the other hand, when I look at the field a bit further back, it looks much better there. In summary, you can say that speed is very important for the knife roller. I have one more question from an agricultural point of view. We always talk about very shallow tillage, 3 to 4 centimeters. What requirements do I have to meet to be able to do that? Agronomy in agriculture must of course fit with the working depth. When customers come to me and say, hey, you're able to cut the all over at a working depth of 3 to 4 centimeters, then I always ask, in which working step? Because if someone comes to me and says they want to cut the stubble breaking all over in 3 to 4 centimeters, I think we all agree that this will be difficult. The combine harvester leaves tracks, maybe the loading wagon leaves tracks, and then we have the field tracks themselves. That's why I always emphasize that the working step has to fit the agronomy.
Then I can cut all over even at 3 to 4 centimeters. These are quite familiar concepts at Hosh. That means that we need level surfaces, surfaces with a low proportion of tracks, and then shallow tillage and flat cutting will work perfectly? Right. That's right, Michel. We are back live on the field. Roman, your presentation of the Fina and Torano seems to have sparked some interest. The first question we got was about the working widths of the Fina. What do we have there? Or what else can we expect? In the series, we started with 6 and 7 meters working width. Of course, we are also thinking about smaller and larger working widths for the three-point machines. Our Fina is a four-bar device. Someone from the audience has asked the question if it's possible to have more than four bars. Do we have something in our portfolio for this? Of course. For this, we have our cruiser series. That means towed machines with six bars. What are the advantages of having two more bars? Additional penetration, more clearance. It is also possible to have better tillage of more organic material and achieve better working results. We took a very close look at the points during the presentation. Here is a question about the service life. How long will the overlap of the points keep its precision? This is a good question that we often get asked by customers. It completely depends on the weather and the soil. The more sand there is in the soil, the faster is the wear of the points. However, we will be able to offer hardened points with duck foot design in the near future. Because the longer the point retains its width, the longer we have a 100% all over cut, which we want to achieve with a finer. Another question on the Terracut point. Why do we use the Terrano with a packer here? Wouldn't it be better without it? This is a frequently asked question. We see the Terracut point as an additional tool for our Terrano. The Terrano is a versatile cultivator where we offer the Terracut point as an additional tool. But in the future, there will be more packer variants. Now let's go back again, to the next part of our recording, back to the mechanical treatment. I would now like to take you with me to the next working step and go back to mechanical weed control. To the classic. To the harrow. At the last Agritechnica, we presented our Cura ST, a weed harrow, if you want to call it that. We are now looking at it together with Andreas and we'll see it drive here in our crop population. Andreas is already waiting for us. Andreas, I've already told our viewers what we brought with us. Maybe you'd like to start with the Cura and give us some basic information. This is the Cura 12ST, a harrow with 12.20 meter working width. The whole machine is foldable in five sections. The special feature of this harrow is the frame concept. It is a self-contained frame construction with welded square tubes. This makes the machine very stable and durable. And additionally, there is the possibility for the individual folded segments to adapt to the field contours. On headland, we have the possibility to lift the wings. This allows us to turn faster without damaging the crop. Yes, Andreas. So much for the frame. Let's take a look at the tine. What is its special feature? After all, in the end, it's all about the quality of work. And that certainly comes from the tines, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. They do the work in the ground. For this, let's go to the front. Here we can have a better look at it. Our tines also have a few special features. One is the positioning of the tine up here. The tines are mounted very widely. This gives us lateral stability. On the other hand, if you look at the tine from below, you can see here that it has a double offset. This means that we have a central application of force so that the tine consistently follows its path. 
So much for the tine. Let's have a look at the top. Here we have mounted springs. The springs are at the top so that we have a maximum clearance for the crop at the bottom. The spring also has a special feature. When I pull it here, there's a fine spring on the inside. In other words, an internal thinner spring, and only then does the thicker spring engage. This allows a wide operating range from 300-400 grams of time pressure up to 4,000 grams of time pressure. I think we'll let the machine drive a few meters and have a look. Just one question beforehand. Is this a stage of development that is suitable for harrowing? How would you evaluate that? Of course, this always depends on the circumstances. In autumn, when you've previously sown grain, it makes sense to start harrowing already in autumn. Or if there's a risk of not being able to get into the field in spring. Or if you already have certain problem weeds that you want to control. Well, Andreas, let's take a look at the harrow's working result. When you go into the field, what is the first thing you look at when it comes to harrowing? The most important thing to me is to check whether we have achieved what we wanted, which is to get rid of the small weeds or bury them. One option is that the weed is pulled out, placed on top and dried out by the sun, or we'll bury it. The second important thing is that the crop is still deeply rooted in the ground. I'd say we've achieved both criteria here quite successfully. What time spacing do we have here in order to be able to really ensure an all-over tillage? Here we have a time spacing of 28 mm. The fact that we have an exact guidance in combination with a driving speed at the 8 mm time diameter ensures an all-over tillage. Good point, the travel speed. What is realistic when it comes to harrowing? Or is there a specific speed range we're looking at? Just now, the speed was 5 km per hour. In general, it's hard to say. It always depends on the soil, how rough it is and how strong the crop already is. If the crops are better developed, you can also drive 10 to 15 km per hour. The Tyne spring concept, does it have any other advantages besides the fact that I can adjust it very precisely? On the one hand, very precisely. On the other hand, I have a very large range that I can adjust. Like I said, when it comes to blind harrowing, when the plants are very small, you can work very gently. Later, when you want to break crusts or have muddy soils, you need a lot of pressure on the tines to get in. All of this is possible here. Furthermore, if necessary, you can also harrow ridge cultures. We can take another look at how this works on the machine. Regarding harrowing, here's an agricultural approach. Besides pulling out weeds and weed grasses, what other effects does harrowing have? There are different ones. On the one hand, to aerate the soil when it is silted up after a heavy rainfall in order to reintroduce oxygen. On the other hand, there are interesting combinations in connection with fertilization measures or for the application of nurse crops. Finally, I would like to take another look at the machine to discuss ridges, because you've made me curious about how this has been implemented. Earlier, I already briefly talked about the tines and the springs. In the end, it's the interaction between the tine and the spring. With the ridge harrow, it is important that you want to have the same force at the bottom of the tine over the entire travel length of the tine. So you can work evenly on the hilltop, on the flank and in the trough. Here, the tine is positioned at the bottom. So it creates a lever and the force is applied at the top. By deflecting the tine, the lever becomes smaller and the force increases. Both neutralize each other, so we have roughly the same force. This is the science of kinematics. This enables me to work with almost the same force on the ridge, in the trough and on the flanks. Correct. And thus, I can achieve the work result that I want to have. Thank you, Andreas. I noticed that harrowing is a real science, which has a strong impact on weed control. However, you have to master it, especially when it comes to achieving an ideal timing. 
First of all, a big thank you to the audience. We're receiving questions every second. Apparently, one of our viewers took a very close look. Andreas, the first question is about increasing the durability of a harrow tine. I got one especially for this purpose, which has some extra coating at the front. What can you tell us about this? Right. We also have the option to equip the tine with carbide. We can see this here in the front area. Of course, this increases the service life enormously. This tine is very advantageous, especially on very abrasive soils with sand, for instance. Another question regarding the weight of the harrow. I don't think we've mentioned that. What's the weight of our 12-meter harrow? The harrow weighs 2,300 kilograms. This gives us the possibility to use the harrow aggressively and still keep a stable position. This is especially important in spring, for example, when crusts have to be broken. One more question. Can the harrow also be used in grassland? In grassland it's definitely possible. There the 2,300 kilograms also have a positive effect, because you can get the weight on the ground, or more specifically transfer 4,000 grams on the tines. So you can work aggressively and do a good job in grassland as well. Now, I got a question from a viewer who clearly knows us. He knows the Hosch company. And the question is whether there will be even larger working widths for the Cura. Of course, we're also working on larger working widths. As a three-point version, like this 12-meter Cura, there are also the 13.5 and 15-meter versions. Everything that's larger is difficult for the three-point version to handle. For this, we have a 24-meter version, which is trailed. Andreas, we have an agricultural question. When the temperatures are around freezing point at night, what do I need to take into account when harrowing? Well, we'll have a very sensitive vegetation. When I expose the roots, they are very sensitive to frost. That means in this case you have to wait for a period of time when there is no frost and postpone it to a later time. But then harrow them a bit more aggressively. Thank you, Andreas. For those of you who have joined us a little bit later, today we have a mixture of our recording and live Q&A. Feel free to ask live questions about our topics. We're happy to answer your questions. So I would like to go back to the recordings from yesterday, to our last item on the agenda. Now I would like to go to our last station of our digital field day, the band spraying. This term is of course not new, it has been around for ages, but anyone who thinks of it will probably have a hoe and a few nozzles in mind. At Hosch, we approach this topic a bit differently, and I've invited an expert who will tell us a bit more about this topic. Hello Jens. Yes, I will. Hello Michael. Why separate band spraying from hoeing? What's the point? This is quite simple. We want to find the optimal weather conditions for each of the two activities. For chopping, this means rather warm and dry. It can tend to produce dust. And as you can see here in the background with our sprayer, it runs in almost optimal conditions today. It is cool, damp, so for spraying, it is optimal according to good practice. This means that we have the best of both worlds, so to speak, in a simplified way. Is this correct? Yes, that's right. What other advantages does a sprayer have? Well, it has on the one hand the advantage that it feels at home on every farm and is mostly even very well equipped with GPS, section control, variable rate control and in our case, of course, always with a well-known and well-proven boom control. In order to achieve an exact ban in the row when spraying with band sprayers, our boom must always be guided at the optimum height of the entire working width. And of course, our boom control, our active boom guidance, is a real benefit here. Now this sounds relatively simple, but the devil is in the details. What equipment do we need to find the rows? You're absolutely right. You need a sprayer with steering, here with our kingpin steering. And on top of that, we made use of other products from our range. We mounted the same camera as shown on the hoe before here on the boom to detect and follow the rows because, for example, machine drifting is quite possible on slopes. Auch, äh, nicht zu vernachlässigen, dass beim Sehen auch, 
It's also important to keep in mind that a row offset can also occur during sewing. This is why the camera is so important. What are the advantages from an agricultural point of view? The advantages are quite obvious. We can reduce the use of pesticides and thus reduce the contamination of the environment. We can optimally use the available agents and are not subject to any restrictions. Because we don't treat the entire area here, but only the band where a mechanism of action is required. I have seen that we spray directly onto the band of the crop. Is it theoretically possible to treat only the space in between? Yes, this is also possible. Does this mean that I can work with offset? Exactly. I noticed that our winter maize is not doing so well in the current weather. Which brings us to the crops. Which ones are suitable for being sprayed in the band? As shown here, the maize is one of the potential plants. But of course, this method works for all row crops. The important thing is just to check if the machine fits the row width. At Horsch, we have a nozzle spacing of 25 in our range, which of course fits perfectly with a row spacing of 50 or 75. Thanks for mentioning the nozzles. What do we have to take into account? Of course, here we don't want a lateral distribution with a sprayer, no triple overlapping because we only want to spray on the row. The solution is to change the offset angle of the nozzles. Here we have an 80 degree nozzle, which we also use for normal spraying with a spacing of 25, but here it is a little more twisted in order to place an exact, precise band only on the row. What exactly means precise? How wide should it be? Here the nozzle has an offset angle of 60 degrees to attain a band that is about 20 to 25 centimeters wide. I think this is a very interesting technology, very much in sync with the Zeitgeist, when the goal is to be even more efficient and to optimize everything. Jens, thank you very much for giving us some insight into band spraying. You're welcome. We've saved the best for last, Jens. We also got some more questions from the audience regarding band spraying. Let's get started right away. First question, when will the system be commercially available? The system with a nozzle spacing of 25, as we see it here, is already available. So anyone who owns a machine with a spacing of 25 can already make use of it. And the camera that we have shown, which is also here behind us in the picture on the silver rail, is currently in the testing phase, so there's something to look forward to. Can the system be combined with any sprayer from our company? It can be combined with all machines for which a spacing of 25 is available, i.e. LT, GS, Tandem and the self-propelled sprayers. Another question, what savings potential do we see in this technology? This depends on the row width and the crop. Here in our example with a maze at a band of about 25 centimeters, you can save about two thirds. Perfect, Jens. Once again, band spraying in a nutshell. Thank you very much. So that was the last station of our digital field day. We had a lot of fun and I hope you enjoyed it as well. It was an experiment with the weather regarding the conditions on the field. But I think that's just farming. Agriculture Live is something we can manage easily. What have we seen today? We showed you how hybrid farming works, i.e. how we can combine chemical and mechanical measures, what topics there are regarding treatment with a harrow, what we see in the sewing sector, in the tillage sector, and to top it all, we showed you a combination to take the next step in chemical plant protection. So thank you very much. We hope to see you next time.